so uh, recollect that um, we talked about the overall modeling to be uh, done in three stages starting with the smallest length scale which is micromechanics so of the order of a few microns and then we went on to look at um, mesomechanics which we didn't cover fully so now today's class will mostly be about that and then uh, eventually macromechanics uh, at the uh, structural component level of the order of a few meters so the outputs of each stage in the order that i just mentioned will be become the input for the next stage right so we'll let's start with the second uh, one there the, which is the mesomechanics which is like an interface between micromechanics and macromechanics okay now here what we are trying to do is just to analyze a single layer of the composite uh, so whether it's a part of a plate or shell or a beam doesn't matter e everywhere uh, these are pretty much like two dimensional structures because the thickness is of a layer is of the order of typically like 0 0.1 uh, mm in fact uh, many cases it's 0 0.125 mm to be more precise and um, so that is the order that we are talking about so obviously you can see that compared to the 10 microns that we are talking about uh, the 125 microns that we are dealing with here is one order um, smaller we say because lower because one order lower essentially means something which is bigger in size right so that's uh, the uh, scale at which we are looking at whereas once we go from here to the macro mechanics uh, of course the thickness uh, typically um, in most uh, <coughs> wings uh, like of passenger aircraft etc we will be uh, having about 80 100 layers and so on and so forth so if you are looking at 0.125 for each layer so you might end up with a thickness of 12.5 mm or so of course you are familiar with based on the exercise that you presented the range of thicknesses that are possible for various uh, uh, vehicles in terms of the uh, skin thickness so you can see the skin thickness itself is um, in terms of orders of magnitude quite different from uh, mesomechanics leave alone micromechanics uh, but uh, this overall size if you're looking at in terms of the uh, span of the wing or the uh, cord of the wing etc they'll run into meters typically and uh, obviously you're uh, uh, going through a much much uh, bigger jump from on in terms of scales now uh, <coughs> any modeling that you do you know, whether it's at meso mechanics micro mechanics or macro mechanics or for that matter not even uh, composites or structures but any course in engineering uh, modeling essentially means that you are translating reality into a math okay so when you are doing that uh, obviously the whatever you call it as a model you call it as a model just because it's not reality right so obviously there's going to be a slight difference between that so if the modeling is good the process is good and uh, appropriate uh, process is employed then it would be as close to reality as is feasible with the current state of the art in terms of the processes in terms of the technologies right but what we are uh, trying to do here is to make sure that we understand the assumptions at each uh, stage uh, so this is a <coughs> thing that i have been stressing upon not only for the way i present uh, the slides during the classes for the lectures but also the way you've been presenting the homeworks uh, at each stage i wanted you to specify the assumption because that's a good practice not only for this course but for uh, you for life not just uh, through academia but irrespective of where your career ends up it's always good to know uh, what assumptions are involved uh, because many of these uh, sometimes are made so often that we tend to uh, do it just uh, in hindsight we don't even think we are making that okay we just assume um, and we don't even know that we have assumed so then uh, there's a danger because you don't know the limitations of your model you go and apply it to a problem where it's not applicable then obviously you're going to get wrong results and you start suspecting the model itself obviously you're applying it to something that it was not meant for it's not going to work so that doesn't mean your model is wrong just that your application is wrong because you didn't know what were the assumptions involved in that so which is why um, throughout today's class now not only in the morning session but in the afternoon session also we will focus on these assumptions and uh, each of these are actually independent assumptions but we will uh, go through it um, in an accumulative fashion that is we'll make a first assumption then we will say along with that if a second assumption is made then what is the simplicity that we get to, okay so but truly speaking for some other application 
you can make any one of these assumptions without the other assumptions. So it's not necessary that you go in that particular order, but for the uh, problem at hand, which is the mesomechanics and also eventually application to macro mechanics, because we already showcased micro mechanics how it is done, right? So now we want to see whether uh, the applicability for a large class of problems for application to any kinds of flight vehicle structures is there, which is what we would like to uh, make sure, right? So as always, we start our learning process with questions. So the question, of course, in terms of um, the whole structural analysis is about how, how are you going to do it, right? So in particular, what you're going to talk about here is how are uh, composites model for structural analysis. Of course, any material modeling may not necessarily be for structural analysis. It could be for a thermal analysis. It could be for many, many different uh, physics applications of it or even beyond physics, chemical applications. So I would say scientific applications of it or engineering applications of it. So when I say uh, how are composites modeled, I'm uh, assuming that you are aware that the purpose for which we are modeling it is structural analysis because that's the title of AE 3140 structural analysis course that we are doing. For this course, how are we going to model it? So whether it is composites or metals or any material, you know, and whether it is for flight vehicle structures or any transportation sector or even static uh, structures like this building, the modeling of a material essentially means for structural analysis, whenever we say modeling of material for structural analysis, we mean one particular thing. And what is that? Let's just see. Here, remember, we are not talking about the geometry, which is another significant aspect. We already covered in Y shells, Y beams, etc. So that's done and dusted. So now we are uh, talking about the material, right? So here what we uh, eventually mean is to have what is known as a constitutive law. And what does constitutive law mean? It essentially means a relation between stress and strain. Okay. So essentially, we have to establish the relationship between stress and strain. So you, you, even before we get to that relation, we should be very clear about what we mean by stress and what we mean by strain. Okay? And both these quantities are three-dimensional quantities. So 3D stress and 3D strain. Okay? And whenever we say a quantity is 3D, all that we mean is that it's dependent on, in general, on all three spatial coordinates x1 x2 and x3 okay here also it's dependent on x1 x2 and x3 and most problems in flight vehicle structures uh, or for that matter any transportation sectors or even in buildings in areas which are subjected to earthquakes etc there is a time dependency as well we don't explicitly say that as 4d stress we just say that, uh, that it's a dynamics problem, but essentially from a spatial point of view, it's 3D is what we mean. So very clearly, if I fix X1, X2 and X3 at a particular instant of time, then I get a particular value of stress. Okay? So in other words, it's a function of a, per, um, a particular point at a particular time in an overall structure. For example, this could be an aircraft wing, a part of an aircraft wing, a panel, a wing panel, which is made out of a composite. And as we have shown over here, you see circular cross section on this side and a length along this, which means that the fibers in the bottommost layer are running along the length of this particular structure. This, let's call this as length, this as breadth, and this as the thickness, right? So in all the layers, you see that the fibers are perpendicular to the thickness direction. But only in the top and the bottom layers are they orthogonal to the structural axis. What do we mean by structural axis? Along the length of the panel, I introduce a coordinate x1 and a unit vector small b1. Along the 
breadth I introduce x2 and a, a unit vector v2 and along the thickness I introduce a coordinate measure x3 and a unit vector b3. Now, these three are mutually perpendicular to each other. So, you have an orthogonal system and b1 cross b2 is b positive b3 therefore, it is a dextral triad. Okay? So, in other words, if this is a, uh, b1 and let us say this is b2 then the downward direction would be b3. On the other hand, if I take this as uh, x1 and x2 is from here in other words, this is chosen as the origin then you would see that b1 cross b2 is upwards. So, be very careful in doing that because a lot of uh, the vector and or tensorial manipulations that you do will uh, change signs depending upon whether it is a dextral triad which is the right handed triad as opposed to a left handed triad and right handed triad is what is commonly used as a convention. Okay? So, now that is very clear. Now, coming back to the bottom layer you see that the fibers are parallel to the x 1 direction and x 2 and x 3 are both perpendicular to it. Similarly, on the top uh, the uh, fiber direction is parallel to your x 2 coordinate or the b 2 axis and b 2 unit vector and uh, all the other two which is x 1 and x 3 are perpendicular to the fiber. But that luxury is there only for this top and bottom layer as shown in this particular uh, layer. It need not always be the top and the bottom layer for any structure. It could be anywhere in between or may not even exist in some uh, cases. Okay? But you typically have the 0 and 90 and if only those two are present you end up with what is known as a cross ply laminate. It is like a matted kind of a structure. Right? Uh, on the other hand in reality for most structures because there will be torsion and other things uh, which need to be handled as well you will have uh, non zero non 90 degree layers as well. So, in this case you see there is plus minus 45 degrees. Okay? So, there are plus 45 and minus 45 degree uh, layers uh, in between as well. So, this just shown to be just a four layer schematic as I said typical um, aircraft applications or any flight vehicle applications for that matter could run uh, of the order of 80 to 100 plies or more right? depending upon the size of the aircraft the kind of stresses that are expected uh, especially from the bending uh, you would uh, modify that and of course in terms of the semi monocoque design which goes into in terms of the stiffening. If the stiffening structures are all very strong then you do not need in the skin that many layers. So, you can uh, expect your um, uh, the stiffeners the stringers and the spars etcetera the spar caps in particular to take most of the bending load and therefore, the skin need not uh, be that many layers uh, because it need not take that much of a flexural load. Now, this is just shown as a schematic just to uh, kind of aid our thought process in the whole thing. So, just uh, bear with me in terms of uh, what this means. right? Now, uh, in meso mechanics which is what we have set, set out to do we are not dealing with this entire uh, set of four plies we are taking one ply at a time. So, we take just like when we did micro mechanics what did we do we did not even take one ply at a time we took one fiber at a time and a matrix sleeve around it. right? So, we took a rectangular or square matrix sleeve around that and we said the fiber exists within that and we just analyze that. Now, we have come one step we are taking baby steps towards analyzing the overall structure. So, like we have gone through kindergarten now you are looking at primary school where you are looking at the Mm, uh, the meso mechanics where you, are, you can now analyze one layer at a time okay? and it need not be a 0 degree layer like this or a 90 degree la layer like this, but any plus or minus theta or any other angle here we showed for plus or minus 45, but could be any arbitrary theta we should be able to analyze that that is what we are heading towards. Now, uh, very clearly we want the relation between the 3D stress and the 3D strain and uh, it is important for us to recollect that both of these are second order tensors. So, in other words uh, mathematically rigorously speaking I should put a double underline under this and a double underline under this to show that it is a second order tensor. What do those two mean that you need to specify two directions in order to specify the measure numbers or components of those stresses and strains. We have already um, said quite a few times, but uh, no harm in saying it again that one of those directions is to identify the phase on which the stress acts, the other is the direction in which the stress itself acts and therefore, you need those two and the corresponding one for is in terms of the 
strain that is involved and whenever you have uh, those two directions um, uh, coinciding it's the same direction we call that as a normal stress okay so both the direction of the cross section by which of course cross section is a plane so when we whenever we say direction of a cross section we mean the direction of the normal to the cross section so it's understood right so this is one if this is the x1 direction then this becomes the x1 plane okay so in other words it's the x2 x3 plane actually but because x1 is parallel to that becomes the one plane or the p1 plane similarly this could be the b3 plane and this could be the b2 plane right now this is uh, something that you have to always remember because uh, truly speaking we can carry out all the derivations all the assumptions that we are talking about today in terms of this mathematically rigorous way but it's kind of little beyond the scope to introduce a lot of those tensorial concepts at this level at the undergrad so uh, every now and then i will give you a taste for it a flavor for it but at the same time we'll do it in a way that we understand best at uh, the level at which we are approaching this particular problem okay so uh, once again i like to stress to you that these are at a point at a given instant of time okay if the point changes at some other location in the same structure the stress changes if at the same point you are looking at it at two different instants of time again these values will change okay and each of these depending upon the coordinate system that you have introduced will also change because in a one particular coordinate system you will have uh, one set of values for the stresses on another coordinate system you will have different and this is something we already saw when we said that uh, even in the presence of torsion or even in the presence of shear there can be compression okay so how did that happen because just change the direction we went to another set of axes and we saw in the original set of axes it was only shear or, or torsion causing only shear but in a uh, let's say about 45 degrees away from that and another set of axes you had tension and compression and one of you actually came to the board to showcase that as well i think it's eva so that is very important to remember that these are at a point in the material so because then it defines the material okay but what does that in in turn mean that uh, if i take the relation between these two i'm saying that that relation doesn't depend on what is happening at the other points same way it doesn't depend on what has happened in the past because the time is fixed and what is what may happen in the future so it doesn't depend on the history or the future it doesn't depend on what is happening in the neighborhood but in reality what happens is you do have a slight dependence in some cases on what is happening in the surroundings because the surroundings tend to just like in our life uh, we can't say that i'm completely immune to whatever is happening around me there are certain things in the environment uh, both in terms of the environmental actually atmospheric conditions or the people that we interact with our uh, experiences change right so similarly the stress at a particular point might depend slightly on the points around it what we call as non local theories but that is again beyond the scope of what we are doing so here we will uh, deal with only local theories okay that's the first thing that it doesn't depend on the neighborhood okay so local theories and uh, no dependence on the neighborhood okay the other thing that uh, is important is we will take out the um dependence on other instants of time in particular the history because uh, you know that the first assumption that we are going to introduce we will see that that will enable that because uh, otherwise in general most materials uh, the behavior will depend upon the uh, strain rate okay so this relationship between stress and strain what we call as the constitutive law will depend on not only the stress and the strain but also the strain rate if you are doing something at a high strain rate for example in impact mechanics problem then you see that the strains that it undergoes depends upon the rate at which the strain changes so the same stress strain relationship could be quite different for a statics problem where i'm just applying a load gradually and trying to uh, increase or decrease it and measure the stress and the strain right through the load cell and or the strain gauges so that's another uh, thing local theories and also 
uh, anyway we are going to introduce that assumption so this particular thing i'm not mentioned in that list but um, it just occurred to me that it's important for us to note this as well especially for those of you eventually probably going to work on uh, structures related problems either uh, uh, in your career or in the uh, undergrad or higher education okay yeah before that um, so that's that's what we are heading towards we are heading towards a constitutive law where we want to relate sigma and gamma now if we want to go, go ahead and do that we have to make certain assumptions like any modeling requires assumptions now the questions that are very important for you to take whatever modeling you're doing and in particular we will sh uh, showcase that with this particular example of structural mechanics modeling or structural analysis modeling is this the set of two questions about assumptions one is whatever assumptions that you're making is it even necessary and this is a very important point most people don't realize that because some of the best theories that we still have today like the euler bernoulli beam theory or the kirchhoff love uh, plate theory these we will see what exactly they mean uh, towards probably uh, later part of this week now these two in spite of being so old and so simple are still valid in other words they are asymptotically correct theories they if you uh, let some of the small parameters tend to zero like the thickness to length or thickness to width or some, some of these uh, small parameters like the uh, matrix stiffness to the uh, fiber stiffness etc if you tend these to zero you will see that these are almost right on top of the uh, 3d elasticity theory so in other words they're so perfect in spite of being so so very simple but the uh, funny part is that those guys be it Euler or Bernoulli or Kirchhoff or Love these are great uh, gentlemen who came up with those theories but when they did it they made certain assumptions and they got to that but today we can show that even without, without making some of those assumptions we can still get to where they went so in other words they thought that their models were applicable to a much more narrower set than it actually is so in other words they were kind of modest in their saying that yes this theory works but they said that it works for a very small class of problems today we know that it works for a much larger class of problems on the other hand there were people who went beyond Euler and Bernoulli like Timoshenko another great name in structural analysis but the way he went and approached the problem his results are so erroneous that he himself had to give what is known as a shear correction factor we will see what all those things mean a little later but this is nothing but a politically correct way or a euphemism for curve fitting so you just find that your result are not agreeing with reality you introduce a correction factor so that it agrees with reality so you're just forcing it to fit into the reality so you can see that people who are very intelligent also might get into issues if they don't pay enough attention to these two they might look very innocuous very simple of course it's obvious but in spite of that we uh, in the business especially if we uh, unlike you guys who are just getting into it who have been there for longer tend to make this mistake even more because we think oh i know it so i mean i don't i'm not making a particular assumption or uh, i'm making an assumption which is not even necessary these kinds of things we tend to uh, have a tendency to do which we have to be alert about which is what i'm trying to bring to uh, the picture over here okay so same thing i mentioned about timoshenko for the beam uh, the same thing holds for the plate or shell theory reisner and mindlin two again very amazing guys in terms of their research output they made uh, higher order theories for plates and shells which again needs these shear correction factors for example so which is again a curve fitting that it eventually goes to why because they made certain assumptions which were not relevant so it's not only that you should not make assumptions which are not necessary so that you know the larger class of problems that your model is applicable to but at the same time uh, you should also give away give up on those assumptions which are not relevant to the problem that you're trying to tackle okay in which case because if you're making that it will make your uh, solution even more narrower than what you set out to do so you are trying to solve a certain class of problems now uh, the end result can either be actually valid for a larger class of problems or even smaller class of problems depending upon the no to either one of these questions okay which is why uh, you have to check for the necessity is it really necessary without making that assumption can i maybe a little more few more steps 
uh, a more little more complex derivation can i get to the same result then you might as well get away with get rid of those assumptions similarly uh, in my actual problem in the real problem is that assumption really valid is it um, something that i'm uh, making an error about so then you have to make sure that uh, those kinds of assumptions are removed as well so this is uh, two important checks and the way we will approach this problem i have a single slide in which i'll be talking for probably for 4 hours today uh, uh, the whole idea is that it's so important okay because that's at the crux of the whole thing and this is pretty much um, three fourth of your structural analysis done if you understand this well so that's that's the level of importance of this because as we do the assumptions we will not only state them but also see what is the mathematical implication and therefore actually uh, end up with that constitutive law finally in the final form that we would like to actually utilize it are there any questions so far on this clear right okay the first um, assumption that we are going to make and i'm going to you be using a color code throughout this whole process um, i'm going to use uh, green font green colored font for certain things which uh, are reasonably valid uh, for most of the problems that we deal with in flight vehicle structural analysis so there's no issue with that there's no uh, need to revisit that of course there are extremes when you go closer to failure when you're doing a crash investigation or damage mechanics and things like that then you have to give up on some of these assumptions but as long as you have a healthy structure operating within the design limits then this is a reasonable assumption to make for most or almost all uh, structural materials there might be things like let's say uh, you're using some other materials which could be getting into the so called plastic regime or uh, more generally inelastic regime then uh, obviously you'll have to uh, relax this particular assumption but rarely do you use for most of the structural components like the skin or the stringers or the spars or the uh, transverse ribs or the bulkheads uh, etc you rarely use anything which is inelastic um, now i think i'm sure from the deformable bodies course you know what is an elastic material so either of you uh, what 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 exactly do you mean by an elastic material so it returns to the original shape very good yeah 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 right so the first important thing is it returns to its original shape as ivan said not only shape but also size because those are the two important aspects of the geometry uh, and uh, when when does it return to the same shape and size the, the right right so which we can say is upon unloading okay so there's a process of loading it where you are applying the loads and then you are slowly removing these loads as well so that's essentially what we mean by that elastic material now this is in terms of words okay uh, is there any other property of the elastic material that you are aware of when you say something is elastic what else do you know about it the forces are like translated for the okay uh, yeah it, it's taking a little far uh, far out but uh, purely from the material point of view we are talking i mean say a material is elastic what do what do yes this is a very important point but and the others are kind of corollaries of this as well but uh, anything else you can think of absolutely yeah yeah so that's a very important point that the load So that's a qualification it's a very important thing that he's brought about that um, when will this happen only if uh, so this is good enough for uh, elastic material but um, that will not happen in other words it will not return to its original shape or size but it will have some residual stresses and or strains uh, depending upon the boundary conditions that are involved of course upon unloading because the load has gone 
beyond the yield strength of that particular material or set of materials that we are dealing with right because here we could be fiber matrix whatever so one material might still be uh, less than yield but the other might have gone beyond yield then there is overall structure is going to have a permanent deformation so when you have a condition like this yes you are within the permanent thing so it's very good that you brought this out because now we are talking about a uh, particular um, characteristic of the material okay yield strength we are talking about whereas here we are more still talking about the geometry of the specimen that we are dealing with now we are talking about and here we talked about the loads and lo unloads uh, also those kinds of things finally we are talking about the actual material property so this is the overall material behavior but obviously it has to depend upon the material characteristics and that's where we are trying to head to and as i said each and every one of the assumptions that you are going to make on this slide there are about 10 or 12 will eventually lead us to a comment about the constitutive law how is sigma related to gamma that's all that we are going to end up with so now whatever you have said is in terms of english okay so it's a it's a uh, essentially a language that we understand each other but remember that we are getting into what is known as modeling right so when you want to get into modeling that's essentially the math that we want to bring in okay so uh, wh wh what do you think this can translate to in terms of the math in terms of your sigmas and or gammas Yeah. The, the relationship up until that point is typically linear. And so maybe we can do that to so we know this we get a relationship between stress and strain. Okay, good point. But that is for the next assumption because linearity is a separate assumption. Uh, you can have a linear elastic material, a non linear elastic material. A linear inelastic material, non-linear inelastic material. So these are two very different um, expressions of what the material will do. So linear is a very important thing that you mentioned because you're talking of two quantities here, and those two quantities, how they relate to each other, is essentially you're talking about. It could be an either a linear or a non-linear relationship, right? But elastic not necessarily means that. For example, if you're plotting a See, this is generic uh, stress and strain. Uh, I have not even introduced the coordinate system here. So, and after I introduce the coordinate system also, I can have nine components or nine measure numbers for stress. Similarly, nine measure numbers for strain, right? So, assume that I have introduced this structural coordinate system, uh, x1, b1 along the length, x2, b2 along the width, and x3, b3 along the thickness, right? Now, once I have that, I can now, whenever I say 1, 1 or 2, 2, I know which directions I'm talking about, right? So if that is the case, I can plot, for example, just to illustrate what is an elastic material. This has to hold, of course, for all the sigmas and all the gammas. But we can take either just sigma 1, 1 versus gamma 1, 1 or any particular uh, combination like that. So let's uh, probably be more little more general and call it sigma ij where i and j can take on any value 1, 2, 3, okay? And I'm plotting it about any strain gamma kl, okay? So many of these might just be 0 because the stress and the strain may not depend on each other. But in general, it is a particular curve that you have, right? So when I say elastic, as Ivan pointed out, it has to return to the original shape upon unloading. For that, there has to first of all be a loading, right? And that loading, as Nafis pointed out, has to be below the so-called yield limit. So if the, for that particular sigma ij, this let us say is the sigma ij yield, okay? Remember that if it is sigma 1, 1 yield, it might be a particular value. Sigma 2, 2 yield might be a different value. Sigma 1, 2 yield might be a different values and so on and so forth, okay? So let's not get into that complication. I'm saying that i and j are fixed. It could be any value between 1 to 3, i, and j could be independently any other value, right? Similarly, k, uh, a third independent value and a fourth independent value that they can have between 1 to 3, okay? So when you're trying to plot that, what Nafiz is saying is that don't load it beyond this. And what Ivan is saying is that if what Nafiz says is fine, then whether I'm loading or unloading, it should not matter, okay? So what it essentially means is that I can go like this if that is the loading path. 
so that's loading and if I unload I come back through the same path that's all that it means so for this you see that this condition both the parts of it whatever Evans and whatever Nafi said are still valid but this is not a straight line what I've drawn so in other words it's a curve right so in other words this is not necessarily linear but it is elastic because the loading went that way the unloading came down this way and at any given value of strain I know the value of a, the stress so this is one particular gamma KL let me call it gamma KL not a particular numerical value at which I know the particular stress value ga sigma ij not so in other words if i if you give me the strain i can tell you the stress alternately if you give me the stress i can tell you the strain so what is this in terms of mathematics so already we said in english we said in a graphical language which is more like visual for us now can we get into some math over there what what exactly are we talking about in terms of functions over there because what we are talking about is two quantities one is related to the other I can either say this is a function of this or this is a function of that equivalent to each other but what does elastic or this particular statement and this particular thing that whether it's loading or unloading and how many other times I load and unload or load and unload doesn't matter you give me the particular value of the strain I will give you the stress and it will be perfect right so as long as this condition is not violated right so if that is the case what is the math behind it how do you state this mathematically yeah so if you're looking at um, y intercept i can still have another curve like this it can which can go like this right so that also if it is as long as it is let's say uh, under the yield limit I'm, i can go back load and unload and come back on that so it has nothing to do with the intercept uh, or a straight line because that is again venturing into the next uh, um, assumption which is what i want you to be really careful about because this is not something that um, is an issue with uh, undergrads but I see people even at professors levels or uh, people who are well educated or even those working in the industry making this mistake if they, they think that if I say elastic it means linear and if it is if I say linear they think it's elastic it's not true these are two totally different concepts yes many a times both might occur for the same kind of materials that doesn't mean that the meaning of the sentence changes so here what we are saying is that it can be any kind of curve and of course straight line is a example of that curve it's a very very specialized case of that curve and that straight line could have a y intercept need not have a y intercept that's also acceptable right but what uh, so this could be for example a situation where you manufacture certain certain components with what are known as residual stresses so you build in a particular stress during the manufacturing process itself so that when it is not loaded it will still be under a particular uh, stress or strain so that's essentially uh, the kind of uh, uh, structure or that particular case is still elastic in other words loading and unloading parts are the same and how many other times I'm loading or unloading give me a stress I can give you a strain and there'll be nothing wrong about it right so that's essentially what that means okay so how, coming once again uh, back to give you a hint of what I'm trying to get at remember at the end of this whole uh, slide I'm trying to get at a as simple a constitutive law as I can which works not only for composites but for metals as well any material that is being used for uh, building a flight vehicle structure uh, we already have done with the geometry so we are only dealing with the material now it's a pure material property constitutive law is a pure material property and that uh, is something that will involve all these limits that you cannot go beyond something etc but at the end of the day it has to be a relationship between these two guys okay and uh, that's a mathematical relationship because with the double underlines you don't even have numerical values for it not even a matrix form for it okay you can have a matrix form as soon as you introduce 
B1, B2, B3 coordinate system or the axis. Once you have an axis, set of axis, and they need not be mutually perpendicular to each other. They can be curvilinear. Uh, they can be need not even be straight lines. This is this could be the x1 axis. This could be the x2 axis. This could be the x3 axis. As long as they those three are not collinear and coplanar, okay. So as long as they are not uh, parallel to each other, uh, in some sense, not in a single plane, nor are they coinciding with each other. Uh, if you just move by a particular distance, they don't become uh, parallel. In other words, they are not parallel to each other. So neither collinear nor coplanar then you can have a co coordinate system. As soon as you introduce a coordinate system, you can write sigma and gamma uh, as matrices, okay? Uh, which will typically be a three by three matrix because we are dealing with three dimensional space. So x1, x2, x3 in both cases. So we will end up with a three by three matrix for this and a three by three matrix for this, in which case I should not continue to use this double underline notation because I already, this is when I have not yet specified the coordinate system. Same thing with vectors. Uh, vector V is one thing and a column matrix of V1, V2, V3 is different. Here I have specified a particular set of unit vectors uh, which is B1, B2, B3, right? So corresponding to that, that vector is defined. So therefore your vector V can be written as v1 b1 plus v2 b2 plus v3 b3 right these are the magnitudes these are the directions all unit vectors but here it is still in its pristine form it's a beautiful vector which has no nothing about knows nothing about column matrices and all these things it, it exists as it is and it's perfect for a lot of mathematical manipulation but if you want as engineers, we want, so this is good enough for a mathematician. They don't even need to go to the next step. But we as engineers, we want to know the values along particular directions. Then we come to this and which directions we are interested in and then find out the magnitudes along those directions. That's where we get to. But some other engineer might say, I don't want along B1, B2, B3. I want along as another set of axis uh, unit vectors, A1, A2, A3, right? So then he will get totally different values for v1, v2, v3, right? It could be v1 star, v2 star, v3 star, okay? Of course, they're related to each other in terms of what angles a1, a2, a3 make with b1, b2, a, b3, and we can transform from one to the other, etc. All, all of which you are already familiar with, but very important for you to remember that when I write without the underline, I'm essentially talking about a column matrix, and when I write with the underline, I'm talking of a mathematical entity which uh, um, has not yet fixed a particular coordinate system into it. And all that uh, uh, V has to obey, this particular V will obey irrespective of which coordinate system it is in. So that's uh, very good for people to do uh, derivations and things like that. But once you want for a ma uh, numerical values for a particular implementation you want to know, then this becomes important. Same thing over here. This is in its pristine form, B1, B2, B3, either for the cross section or B1, B2, B3 for the, uh, the direction of the stress itself are not yet specified. So that's exactly what we are trying to do over here, that in the pristine form that it is, it's very good um, as a mathematical notation and for derivations, etc. But once you specify uh, the uh, set of unit vectors, and remember, in most cases, you will specify B1, B2, B3 for the top bar and B1, B2, B3 for the bottom bar, but it's not necessary. I can specify B1, B2, B3 for the top bar and some other set of unit vectors A1, A2, A3 for the bottom bar. So that's also possible. So it's called as a mixed basis. Okay. Same thing over here also. You can have mixed basis or you, and it's quite common in uh, something called the deformation gradient tensor, which you need to use to derive this you will see that mixed basis is uh, actually much more natural for that uh, particular quantity and you will actually use uh, the undeformed and deformed basis for that in order to arrive that. So let's um, not go deep into that because it's, it's a little more complex than is necessary for this particular purpose. But coming back, all that I'm talking about is uh, every assumption that I make is going to simplify the relationship between sigma and gamma either in its pristine form or in a matrix form. Once it is in a matrix form, you're talking about a three by three matrix for each of these. So your sigma matrix will be 
we have specified b1 uh, let me call it just bi and you have specified uh, let me make it explicit itself so the first underline that i have i choose b1 b2 b3 the second one also i choose b1 b2 b3 set of unit vectors so this gets fixed no longer in its pristine second order tensorial form but in a particular matrix notation which would be sigma 1 1 sigma 2 2 sigma 3 3 sigma 1 3 sorry 1 2 sigma 1 3 sigma 2 3 sigma 2 1 sigma <coughs> 3 1 sigma 3 2 and always remember that the first uh, subscript is identifying the row for you and the second subscript is identifying the column for you this is something you are already familiar with just reminding that right so keep that in mind right now uh, this is a stress similarly uh, you would have for the strain as well uh, all that will replace is the sigmas with gammas right so you have gamma 1 1 gamma 1 2 gamma 1 3 etc all the way to gamma 3 3 that's that's what you have so now uh, what can we do about this when we say that it's an elastic material in english you said it returns to its original shape and size upon unloading after loading below the yield strength limits perfect okay that's the right way of defining your elastic material same thing we went to define it graphically one is linguistically the other way we are trying to look at it is graphically all that we are seeing is that irrespective of what the path is uh, whether you are loading or unloading or how many times you have loaded or unloaded you given a particular value of either of these quantities the other quantity can be got okay so in other words what is it mathematically speaking because here we are talking of sigma ij as a function of gamma kl gamma kl as a function of sigma ij so when you have such a functional dependence that given one you can get the other what kind of a function do you call that True, the, every function uh, has an output which is a function of the inputs, right? So that's true. But now, what is that special relationship between the output and the input? In this case, let's say uh, instead of keeping the arbitrariness, let's say sigma ij is the input and uh, gamma uh, is the output, gamma kl is the output, right? So I'm applying a particular stress on this and at a given um, at a particular point in the structure. And uh, because of the load that I'm applying at a particular point in the structure, there's a particular stress at a particular point in time. Okay. Now that is related to the strain that it develops at the same point at the same instant in time, right? Under the same load, under other same boundary conditions. Now this, yeah. Is it, is it just a linear? linear? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's not. We, we just discussed that. So in fact, linear will be something that we will come to next. Okay. So what we are saying is that's why we sh showed it in this. See, any linear relationship should be on this uh, set of axes a straight line, right? It could be a straight line passing through the origin, or it could be a straight line which is intercepting at uh, y-intercept, non-zero y-intercept, right? Both those are talking about a different property of the same material, which is a linear material, which we'll go to. In fact, immediate next assumption that we will go to, right? But now we, all that we are talking about is that. Uh, at irrespective of which time we are talking about at given a particular instant of time and irrespective of which point in the structure we are talking about at a particular point and particular instant in time given a stress i can get you the strain and these remember there are like three into three total of nine measure numbers here and three into three nine different measure numbers here so nine into nine 81 such graphs can be drawn okay each and every one of those 81 graphs will have a particular curve very different from the others and e but each one of them from each one of them given a particular set of stresses i can get a particular stresses set of strains and vice versa okay 
So that is what elasticity is all about. But that's fine in terms of words, in terms of a graph. I'm, I'm trying to get, because the whole idea here is modeling. And modeling essentially means that mathematical modeling to be more precise, because we want to do a structural analysis based on this. So in that structural analysis mathematical model, I want you to tell me what does this elastic uh, mean? Because both these are right. So this is right and this is also right. Okay. So graphically, we have understood the problem. Linguistically, we have understood the problem. But mathematically, we have to understand only then we can get into the mathematical uh, aspect of it. What is what exactly it means? Okay. So now it's clear that the whole purpose is to get to the constitutive law, which means a functional relationship between these two whether in its pristine mathematical notation or in the matrix notations like this, you know, one set of unit vectors are fixed for both stress and strain, right? So now, whether it is this or that, that relationship between sigma versus gamma is what we are talking about, okay? In a matrix notation, I can write it this way. In a uh, tensorial notation, I can write it with the double underlines, okay? So now when you're talking about the one is a function of the other and vice versa, what particular kind of function they are so that the loading and unloading will be the same. An example where it is inelastic, if you see, could be where, let's say when you're unloading, it comes back like this, right? So this is loading, this is unloading, then this becomes an inelastic material, right? Whereas this is a elastic material. So now can you say, based on this particular picture, what kind of a function is this? As opposed to the original function which I had, which was just going up and down this way, it, now you have the same curve tracing back a different path. Okay? Now what can you say about this particular function sigma ij of gamma kl? If, if it's complicated for you to look at it in this notation, let's think of this as just y. Think of this as x. So a function y of x. Right now, instead of going just on the same curve, I'm going on one curve, coming back on the other curve. So now, what kind of a function is y of x? One, two, one. Exactly. So it's single valued, right? So what we had earlier, which is for the elastic material, is a single valued function. So th which is why, given this, without any ambiguity, without any confusion, I can tell you this is what it is. And given this, I can get to that. So 1 is to 1 correspondence is there between the stress and the strain. So that's essentially the mathematical nature of this. Yeah? So, so I can write, let's say your sigma, that matrix as a matrix function of sigma of gamma this way, right? So, and that holds for every one of the uh, measure numbers of sigma as well. So once I, because once I've got it into a matrix notation, I've already fixed the set of unit vectors and we will not complicate problems by saying, two different sets of unit vectors, which is possible in general, Bs and As, but we'll say both are Bs, both in the case of sigma as well as gamma. So once I have that, I have in the form of a particular matrix, then I have nine measure numbers for that, just like we explicitly wrote out for the stresses. Now I can write the same thing over here, which is your sigma Ij KL, right? Now, i j k and l take on the values 1 to 3 and as i said all latin indices the default is this whenever we use latin indices we will say it goes 1 to 3 if it's a uh, greek letters we will say it goes only 1 2 which is very convenient to do deal with both uh, plate problems as well as beam problems when we get there right now uh, there are also uh, exceptions to this. So this is uh, the default, but we will very soon see once we make a few assumptions, 
we will take this all the way up to 6 1 2 3 4 5 6 okay so let's say that this is the default if i don't specify this then yes they take on the values 1 2 3 but coming back to this particular approximation that we did elastic all that it is saying is that this is a single valued function and it's a it need not be a linear function which is what i want to bring it to, to the point because both nafis and and i mentioned that uh, it's a straight line or it's a linear uh, curve it's not necessary okay so that's a separate thing okay so now uh, all that this is saying is that if given this i get that because the other example if you see the negative example then you can see what exactly i mean for a given value of gamma kl i can get two values of stresses so if i take another instead of this gamma kl naught i take some other gamma kl star then you see there is an ambiguity i can either have this stress or this stress and if i don't know the history i don't know whether i am loading or unloading i don't know which of them it might be okay so in other words you can't give a single valued function like this right so that's the important thing about elastic material and that's the crux of everything that we do and because it's in green font as i already mentioned it means that it's a valid assumption as long as you're dealing with healthy structures which are not close to damage or gone beyond yield as um, uh, nafis pointed out so we say that so as long as that is taken care of this is a very valid assumption and we use it uh, almost uh, without even knowing that we use it it's important to remember that it is valid okay now we get on to the second assumption which you already in many cases talked about that is material linearity right so uh, i'm using yellow as like our amber just to go with the traffic light kind of thing because at the end of this slide i'm going to make a few assumptions which almost all your textbooks and all your courses are make um, sometimes with telling you sometimes without even telling you about it and those are those all will be in red okay but now here we are talking about something which is kind of dicey as long as you're careful a bit then this is valid okay just like you said there is an yield limit there's also something called a proportionality limit okay for most materials that up to a particular point these curves will be almost like a straight line even if you see the way we have drawn it if i look at draw a tangent at zero you would see that for some while it looks like almost a straight line and then it starts curving right so that is the proportionality limit so it's a particular limit up to which it is linear in other words i do not need to write this as a generic nonlinear relationship because the way it is written it could be any function see it could involve cosines of gamma it could involve sines of gamma it could involve logarithm of gamma it could involve uh, powers of gamma uh, like polynomials etc or uh, something to the power constant to the power gamma any kind of arbitrary function could be there uh, to let your imagination run wild so all of that is still possible with an elastic material uh, theoretically speaking okay so this is uh, a nonlinear function in general so so far whatever we have done is only for the first assumption now if we bring the second assumption then i can say these two are related uh, in terms of constants of proportionality some of you mentioned proportionality uh, as well in a different context there but that was not valid there now it is valid okay so in other words if i write this sigma ij after making the second assumption so this is elastic which was our first assumption now the second assumption material linearity says that i can introduce constants e which multiply this gamma kl and those constants will be different for different choices of ij and different choices of kl okay so i'll put that as ij over here in subscript and kl here as superscript okay this subscript and superscript actually have a little more deeper meaning from a mathematical point of view what we uh, are say in terms of covariant basis contravariant basis etc but that's beyond the scope of this just for this particular case just be with me that i'm putting whatever is the stress 
um, subscripts over here and whatever is the strain subscripts on the top just to distinguish what is the stress subscripts and what are the strain subscripts okay and I introduced this uh, concept to you earlier uh, what we called as the Einstein's summation convention which all that it says is repeated indices on one side of the equation in this case RHS right hand side involve summation over their entire range in this case 1 to 3 later on we will see examples where it goes 1 2 3 4 5 6 and we will see the summation is over all those 6 quantities so here we see that on the right hand side i appears only once j appears only once but k appears twice and similarly l also appears twice which means that even though I am not explicitly stating it over here, there is actually an implied summation over here, which is a double summation over both these guys who are getting repeated, namely K and L. And as I said, over the entire range. So it has to be from 1 all the way up to 3. Similarly, here also it has to be from 1 all the way up to 3. So in other words, there are 3 into 3, 9 terms over here. Okay. So, one particular stress measure number is related to all the nine strain measure numbers in general. Okay. Some of those coefficients can go to zero for certain materials in certain directions. That is fine. But in general, you will have nine such terms. Okay. So, because Ij keeps get is fixed, only K and L are changing. And so, K and L each change by three. So, three into three, which is what you see in the summation are nine terms similarly how many such equations are there how many equations will you have like this this is one equation for a given value of i and j nine right so nine equations each of which have nine terms right and so each of those will have a constant of proportionality a coefficient that you see so there are nine into nine 81 such coefficients so it's very clear even by just looking at the sub, um, subscripts and superscripts that each of them have three so it's three into three into three into three or nine into nine which is 81 right so that therefore there are 81 such coefficients or what you can call as constants of proportionality because there are nine equations and each of the nine equations has nine terms in it so total of 81 terms and each term has a constant of proportionality so therefore there are 81 constants of proportionality or 81 coefficients so now what this linearity is essentially doing is instead of the arbitrary nonlinear function that you had is simplifying it by saying that all of them are linear functions and if you need to know all of those relationships fully in general you will require 81 such coefficients okay and if this were really the case and a particular material had all this level of uh, simplification to uh, two levels of simplification only elastic and material linearity then you would have to do actually nine experiments each of those nine experiments you will apply only one of those stresses sigma 1 1 only in one experiment sigma 2 2 only in one other experiment etc and each time you will measure through strain gauges all the nine strain strains and then therefore based on those plots that you do you will get up get uh, those nine coefficients the numerical values for that and then you will have this full relationship between sigma ij and gamma k now this is an initial notation 
The same thing can be go uh, gotten back in terms of your pristine mathematical notation of tensors where you would write the same equation as sigma equal to E with four underlines now because it has four indices and four directions that need to be dealt with two coming from the stress two coming from the strain and multiplied by your gamma and the way uh, this particular multiplication is written remember that when you are talking of vector multiplication you are uh, familiar with dot products you are familiar with cross products etc here it's like a double dot product that you are essentially doing over here to contract two of the indices associated with k and l so that only i and j are left remember there in, in e you had i j k l but because there is an implied summation over k l the two of that gets uh, reduce through these dot products I'll come to you uh, and then you end up with just two remaining indices i j yes or no very good yeah so essentially what you're doing is how do you actually carry out this summation okay so what you do is you keep k fixed let's say one and then you keep on varying l one two three you get three terms now you you change k from one to two then you get to another set so that's exactly so it's essentially dot products going in a sequence okay so you carry out one dot product at a time based on one of the indices and then you carry out the dot product based on the other indices so it's essentially you're nesting the two in between and yeah absolutely uh, that's what it, uh, einstein's convention is right so you're talking about the double summation that you're having yeah so that's what is adding up okay first you add up uh, within a bracket right, right. and then you add up those brackets bracketed terms yeah. any any other questions on this so right now we have made these two assumptions elastic and le material linearity again remember that we're not talking of linearity in general there can be various other types of linearity as well here we are focusing on material linearity because our whole purpose on this slide and in uh, whole of today's class all four hours is to deal with the material model we already have a geometric model in place for beams uh, shells etc we have talked about it qualitatively we'll come back to it quantitatively later on right now our focus once again is back on the material alone and uh, because the material again we're not talking of any kind of physical or uh, chemical properties etc we are only interested in structural analysis and therefore the uh, correlation between the stresses and strains at a given point x1 x2 x3 at a given instant in time uh, i'm not tiring uh, tirelessly telling you this uh, repeatedly it might sometimes seem boring but this is very very important because many tend to um, take this for granted and that's what they get into problems with which is why it's very important for you to understand that these are point functions at a given point in the material at a given instant in time okay at any other point in space and a, or any other instant in time they will be different and you will have a different set of relationship there for example if you take this heterogeneous structure over here in one of the layers you see if i'm at a point here if my x1 x2 x3 is such that I, it points to this particular point in time at a given instant in time then obviously I've, what it leads to is the sigma and uh, gamma relationship for a fiber on the other hand if i'm somewhere here it leads to the sigma and gamma relationship for a matrix right so which point in the structure i am at will indicate which of these is the actual uh, relationship that i'm doing and therefore for which material part of that overall structure or component that you have okay So now we have these two uh, equations. We have also talked about 81 coefficients. Now we get on to the third of these. Now even before, uh, maybe I should have talked about it uh, even uh, before I went to this slide, is that even though I've been talking about gamma being a second order tensor, and once it's expressed in set of uh, basis vectors, it becomes a three by three matrix like this. Instead of sigmas, you have gammas. The uh, thing about strains is that just like stresses, there are many, many different definitions of that. And most of these definitions are given the names of people who first came up with that kind of a definition. 
For example, there's something called the Green Lagrange strain or German Bio Cauchy strain, etc., etc. There are many, many different examples. Henke strain, etc. Some of these are not even uh, uh, in terms of uh, polynomials. They, they could have logarithms, etc. They are suitable for certain specific applications. What we will use throughout this course is what is known as the Green Lagrange strain. And once you fix which type of strain that you are defining the stress gets automatically defined because there is something called a conjugate pair. There is a conjugate pair of strain rates and stress leading to what is known as a strain energy rate. And that correlation means that I cannot use any Tom, Dick and Harry's uh, strain with some other Tom, Dick and Harry's stress. Okay? I have to pair them appropriately only then the whole modeling process will go right. Of course, I can transform from one type of stress to the other or one type of strain to the other, but the uh, constitutive law that I am talking about will be valid only when those two specific choices are made or in other words, one of them is chosen, the other has to be chosen in only one unique way. Okay? Then only you get these unique set of curves that you are talking about. Right? Now keeping that aside, most of the strains, even though I listed some three or four examples, Every one of those strains that I talked about and uh, for most of structural analysis including the green Lagrange strain that we will deal with here are such that your gamma is symmetric. In other words, if I write that 3 by 3 matrix, I will have only 6 independent coefficients. In other words, uh, if I know uh, gamma 1, 2, I will know gamma 2, 1. I am talking about this with writing sigma here but uh, remember that I am talking about the 3D strain over here. Okay, So, maybe uh, to avoid confusion, let me rewrite that. So, when we say this matrix is symmetric, the off diagonal terms have a certain relationship between them. These two are equal to each other and these two are equal to each other. So, in general we say gamma i, uh, let me use the same dummy index what I used, it does not matter, but just to avoid additional confusion over here. So, essentially if you are interchanging the first and the second index, they remain the same. Of course, if it is a repeated index like k and l are both 1 let us say, then obviously gamma 1 1 equal to gamma 1 1 is a trivial result, you know that for sure. So, this is interesting only when you are talking of the off diagonal terms because now gamma 1 2 and gamma 2 1 are equal to each other and so on and so forth. Right? So, that is your symmetry for this which means that you really do not have 81 independent coefficients here because for most strain definitions you will have only 6 independent strains. So, whether you are talking of gamma 1 2 or gamma 2 1 for a particular sigma i j, they will have the same coefficient. So, in other words, the number of coefficients will reduce. How many do you think you will need instead of 81? Because of this simplicity that gamma is symmetric. So, gamma or the strain is symmetric. So, now instead of um, the generic way in which I have written here, you have all these three equals. Okay? The off diagonal terms, the corresponding off diagonal terms are equated based on this particular uh, expression of symmetry. Right? So, obviously, you are going to have a simpler model. How many do you think it will reduce to from 81? Yeah, why 36? Uh, no, see, um, what we have stated here is only about gamma, okay? okay? Because it's a strain, okay? By definition, so this is symmetric by definition. So most kinds of gammas that we will use, like Green Lagrange or Jaumont by Cauchy, etc., they are all symmetric by their very definition. If you look at the definition, you interchange the subscripts, you will see that 
it remains the same so the, which is why we say it is symmetric so we're just taking advantage of that this is not an assumption okay uh, which is why i said maybe i should have probably talked about it even before getting to this slide which is all about assumptions okay this is not even an assumption you're choosing a particular strain okay uh, as long as you're choosing the appropriate uh, stress conjugate for that strain rate then you're well and good right so for green lagrange for example you use what is known as a, a second piola kirchhoff so this is green lagrange uh, you don't need to remember this but just an additional information so it's a green lagrange strain and its rate of change is um, conjugate to what is known as a second second pilo kirchhoff stress so whenever we say strain or stress we mean these two guys okay we will not uh, again revisit these names these are not of much significance anyway mm -hmm. i'm not a uh, major votary for naming things after people rather than uh, naming after uh, what physics or what science or what engineering it establishes of course we just is just a question of giving honor to those people who uh, brought it out like we say newton's laws rather than laws of mechanics right so uh, something like that so this this is all that it is so um, for all practical purposes when throughout this course when you're talking of the stress and the strain we are referring to these two guys but without mentioning their names as stress and strain itself right coming back to my question earlier we said if we didn't know that gamma is uh, symmetric we had 81 coefficients after making the first two assumptions of elastic and linear material how many would it uh, reduce to and one of you said 36 other said 54 can you argue out which is yeah yeah not e sigma yeah so sigma you have nine and for gamma you have only six independent uh, entities so in other words it could be fully populated you can have all nine non-zero just that if you know six the other three can be determined okay it's just that six independent so it should it's very important to remember the number of non-zero coefficients need not necessarily be the number of independent coefficients okay number of independent we know that if you give that many number then i can get the rest that's all that it means so i need three normal strains and any three shear strains of course not any three uh, one of each pair because i if you give me this this and this then obviously i don't know this right so you have to have one of each pair so then you end up with three shear stresses three shear uh, normal stress sorry three shear strains and three normal strains so you have total of six and those six have to be related to these nine guys okay so nine six uh, 54 which is what uh, ivan mentions that's 54 coefficients or constants of proportionality that we have. Is that clear? Yeah. So, are they equal, equal, or are they less than equal? They, they are equal, equal. So, exactly, gamma 2 1 and gamma 1 2 are exactly equal to each other. Okay. So, let's take a simple example of a linear strain definition. some strains that you are already familiar with from your deformable bodies but uh, there is a source for how it came even if you go for a non-linear model uh, of the green lagrange strain you will define it in terms of what is known as a deformation gradient tensor and this would be your gamma but a simplified form of that a linearized version of that would be what is you are familiar with let us say you are you are talking of let us say not this let us say gamma ij would be the di displacement along the i direction taking derivative with respect to xj plus dou uj 
by dou xi with a factor of 2. Uh, to make it even more uh, familiar with what you probably know is I fix i and j as 1 each then you get what is known as gamma 1 1 a normal strain and you see both of these terms become the same dou u1 by dou x1 dou u1 by dou x1 and therefore the 2 uh, multiplied by a half so they get cancelled and therefore you end up with just dou u1 by dou x1 a very familiar thing that you are uh, from your uh, deformable bodies course and now even if you have nonlinear terms you will see that uh, this kind of holds that symmetry holds okay here of course you know symmetry doesn't mean much because you're going to interchange one and one you end up with gamma one one again okay where it is more significant is to apply this equation for i and j having different values let's say one two so this implies gamma one two is equal to one half of the partial derivative of u1 with respect to x2 plus the partial derivative of u2 with respect to x1 so this is what you have and if you have nonlinear terms you will have a few more there right now you see what happens if i take gamma 2 1 that's going to be dou u2 by dou x1 plus dou u1 by dou x2 right so now you know that uh, addition is commutative whereby all that we mean is if you have a, some two quantities a plus b you can interchange the addition and you get b plus a right so that's exactly what's happening within the brackets over here so for gamma 1 2 you have this uh, uh, terms 1 and 2 now it's getting interchanged the second term is coming over here the first term is coming over here just by expanding the same rotation that we have so all that it's doing is that these two are equal to each other so by very definition we see that gamma 1 2 and gamma 2 1 are equal to each other uh, is this what you meant by equal equal uh, right so uh, you're satisfied with what what i talked about right so now uh, that's that same thing holds with uh, other most other definitions of strain as well and uh, will also hold and this a uh, is not something you need to be bothered about but since i wrote it out i should also specify what it is it's called the deformation gradient tensor okay dgt deformation gradient tensor and um, uh, in the original tensorial notation you will have a double underline for each of these quantities because they are all second order tensors the i is the uh, identity dyadic okay so do, from the point of view of your course don't bother about these things but these are the basis on which the expressions are typically given in your textbooks and or your courses so it's it's always good to be aware of this so for those of you who are eventually going into more detailed understanding of this uh, some of these uh, terms might be useful because there's nothing big deal about it uh, except when you introduce uh, people's names like green lagrange paola kirkov uh, timoshenko euler bernoulli uh, reisner mindlin oh gosh this looks like very very complex stuff but actually speaking they're all fairly straightforward things just that uh, too many names to remember just like history um, then you uh, tend to get confused what exactly it is but for most purposes there's very simple math going on in this whole process and uh, you will end up with something that uh, you see is uh, fairly reasonable what agrees with what you uh, see in simplified versions of the same equations in textbooks etc right so what is the time now you still have time good uh, so are the first two assumptions and the fallouts clear for you so that we can get into the third assumption anybody has any questions doubts good to go yeah okay let's uh, get to the third one so maybe i'll just erase some of these things to create space for that
How many of you are familiar with the concept of body forces? Body forces, yeah. Can you give an example, uh, Nafis? Uh, body forces. Very good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Why do we call it a body force uh, uh, as opposed to any other force that you're familiar with? Very good. Yeah, yeah. So essentially distributed within the entire structure. Okay both its surface as well as its interiors it's a body force right and we all talk about it quite a lot because that's something that we experience even in our own body uh, as you mentioned weight is a example of a body force because of gravity and essentially you're putting uh, a particular structure in a particular field right it could be a, a gravitational field it could be any other force field and um, different parts of that body experience different uh, levels of forces uh, you typically call that body forces and you want to get the resultant of that you integrate that in the case of the gravitational field you get the, the weight of that particular body right now uh, this is something that is not really talked about is the question of body moment so but since you know body force i think you can very clearly see what body moments mean any guesses on that you don't need to give examples, but what do you think a body moment is? Some sort of vibration. Uh, vibration, yes. So you are then bringing an aspect of time, uh, whereas a body force need not be subject to time. So at a given instant of time, you can have a body force because there is a gravitational field. There is a body which is having a mass distribution. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so, so that's a body force. What about a body moment? This boils down to the uh, difference between a force and a moment, right? So, what do you mean by a moment? Exactly, right? So, essentially, you have a couple or a torque, right? So, uh, two forces which are opposed to each other, and there's essentially the distance between them. Or even if there's a single force about a particular point, you're taking the moment of that, right? So essentially, there's a distance of the force, as you rightly pointed out, Anne, uh, uh, from the point at which we are interested in, right? So when you have something like that, you end up with what are known as body moments, okay? So uh, one classic example of where body moments are there is in a magnetic material, which is in a magnetic field. So you have what are known as dipoles. So each of the um, uh, small quantities of material is made out of a few dipoles so it's the dipole distribution that happens there and each one of them uh, depending upon the magnetic field experiences a moment okay so it's a moment distribution throughout the body okay but rarely in structural analysis we do we use um, materials which are magnetic or uh, in a magnetic field of course the earth is a huge magnet the magnetic field is there but rarely you use magnetic materials to construct most of your um, structures right of course, you use steel, which involves an iron, but it's not in a magnetized form. Okay, so iron can be magnetized, but it's not used in its magnetized version on, let's say, a landing gear or whatever. So you typically do not have those dipole distributions, and similarly, there are no other sources of body moments that you typically know for most uh, materials in aerospace vehicular applications, structural applications. So that being the case, yes. There are some uh, smart materials like magneto rheological kind of materials, uh, etc., where you want to actually utilize the magnetic field and how it is kind of related to some other uh, mechanical field. And then you want to see uh, whether you can use it as a sensor and or an actuator or both. So then, of course, uh, you will have to uh, take care of that. But for most parts, it's even the sensors, actuators, etc., are very, very small parts of the overall structure so that's not something that you need to be uh, overly concerned about so for all of structural analysis this is a reasonably good uh, approximation which is why i put it in green font that no uh, body moment distributions in the uh, material which constitutes the structure right so now how is this important because remember uh, we have been saying that one whether it is necessary will it simplify certain things for us whether it is relevant so far whatever i have talked about body moment is i have only answered the second question yes it is relevant 
because rarely we use magnetic materials to construct um, uh, structure uh, and therefore uh, and there are no other body moments and or fields as well to be worried about so therefore it is relevant okay but is it necessary can i do uh, without even stating this can i go have go about doing it um, or invoking this does it bring any simplicity into what we already know see because the stage at which we are right now remember after making those first two is uh, where we have said that our sigma ij is equal to eij kl into gamma kl where of course only six, uh, six of the gammas are independent nine of the stresses are independent so we have 60 uh, nine into six 54 uh, such coefficients to determine okay so in terms of experiments how will you go about doing it we uh, explained this in the case when we had 9 by 9 we had not had talked about the symmetry of this then we said we had to do nine experiments in each case you have to make nine measurements you plot all of them to get the slopes and then which essentially gives you the constant of proportionality so through nine experiments and nine measurements in each one of those experiments we were able to get it now that we know that this is symmetric we don't need nine measurements we need only six measurements because only six of these are independent three diagonal terms and three off diagonal terms that is the three normal strains and the three shear strains so therefore you need only six measurements but you still need to do nine experiments nine six or 54 uh, uh, measurements uh, and plots based on them to get the slopes and therefore the constants of proportionality here okay so now um, i'm asking whether this question has an yes for the third assumption that you're making uh, we already said it is relevant can we say it is necessary how does it uh, make an impact on this because at the end of the day whole thing is about modeling and modeling a material uh, for structural analysis always means getting to the constitutive law constitutive law always means relationship between sigma and gamma the stress and the strain now i started with the most complicated expression sigma is some arbitrary function of gamma then we uh, did the elastic and then we did the material linearity and came up with this and we also invoked the symmetry of this to make the number of constants to be determined much lesser can we do something uh, more to simplify this once you introduce the no body moments The idea is we got down from 81 to 54 here. Can we get down even further? And the hint is this particular thing helps you do that. And therefore, you, since you're going to get to a simpler model by invoking this assumption, therefore, the answer to this question is yes. But how does it simplify? How does it bring this down? Already we brought it down from 81 to 54. How can we bring it down? And in fact, it brings down to the number that you already mentioned of is 36 so it is this assumption which brings down from 54 to 36 so i want uh, to you to think aloud and see how it brings down to 36 how did it go from 81 to uh, 54 because of the symmetry of this right yeah absolutely yeah removing a dimension yeah uh, by which what do you mean uh, in terms of the equation exactly what do you mean Removing a dimension. I don't know how I'll go about that. Sure. So, uh, see, removing a dimension is essentially you're trying to do what is known as a dimensional reduction, right? right? So, dimensional reduction is when you're going from a 3D model to a 2D model or a 1D model. That's all about the uh, geometry. But now we are focused on the material. Okay. So, there's nothing to do with geometry here. Of course, it can do with the geometry of the microstructure of the material and all that which is uh, in the parlam of the uh, material scientists, we are not waiting there, right? So here, purely from the point of view of material, we are not doing any dimensional reduction, okay? So, uh, but of course, you can talk of it dimension in a very, very generic sense that you're, instead of nine, uh, we came down to six. So same thing as uh, Anai just hinted, we can come down from nine to six here as well, okay? Because we had nine and six, it was nine into six, 54 constants. Now we have, if we can uh, bring this down to 6 as well, then we have 6 into 6, 36. 
okay so it's a big reduction that we have because now we can do only six experiments apply only each one of those six stresses and then uh, measure the six strains in each case and with those six into six 36 measurements you have 36 plots each of them you get a slope and then you get these 36 uh, values uh, in place right now we already know these two can be interchanged if i interchange k and l it doesn't make a difference because by definition strains are symmetric so that same thing holds good here also which is why because the k's and l's can be interchanged that's why this came down to just 54 right now the question is can i make the same thing over here so it's a question so that these two can be interchangeable as well in which case we get down to 36 as you just pointed out right so now uh, the answer is yes the no body moment is what leads you to the question of symmetry of the stresses but very very few or at least i have not seen any book or any uh, people talking about this particular fact that you have to uh, if you have to uh, go to the symmetry of this then you have to just like people say by definition gamma k l is symmetric most people will just say by definition your sigma ij is symmetric no it's not okay because the a way that sigma ij equal to sigma ji is derived that is the symmetry relationship which we have noted so we'll put a question mark above that equal to sign so the way this particular thing this symmetry is derived is by so called moment equilibrium at an infinite simul volume element so in other words you have a very large flight vehicle structure in which you take up a small infinitesimal element okay and now you introduce the coordinate system let's say x1 x2 and oops x1 x2 x3 right a coordinate system like this now uh, because i need to check three such equations for 1 2 whether it is equal to 2 1 1 3 whether it is equal to 3 1 and 2 3 whether it is equal to 3 2 okay so if i do one of them you'll be satisfied that the same thing similar kind of thing can be done for the others without loss of generality okay so let's just take in one of the planes let's say they take the uh, one two plane so you have essentially x1 here and x2 over here right so now uh, what is the stress shear stress that acts in this on this face from the notation you remember the first one talks about what is the normal to that section right so this is on the bottom face this is something that goes through or out of the board in the x3 direction right so x3 comes out right so on the bottom face i'm drawing a shear stress so what is the normal to that bottom face yeah so this shear stress which i can also write sigma but the same thing but because i know it's a shear stress i'm writing it as tau but it's the same sigma so the first subscript is 2 okay what direction is it acting in yeah so because this is the negative x2 direction or negative b2 rather so therefore and the stress positive convention for that is to act in the negative x1 direction so the way i have shown this is tau 2 1 right so what about this phase over here what would be the shear stress acting on that yeah because b1 is perpendicular to that surface and b2 is the direction which the stress itself acts right so that's very clear now uh, remember that th we, it's uh, this particular thing need not necessarily translate to the top because there's a certain loading distribution on this whole thing with or without body moments this is going to uh, be subjected to certain variation in stresses from point to point so in other words 
because it's tau to 1 it need not be tau to 1 on the top as well okay it will vary by a certain amount and how much will it vary by so this size of this element that we have taken eventually of course we will um, take the limit as the, this goes to 0 but this is delta x1 okay similarly this size over here is delta x2 right so eventually you want to get shrink it to a point because all these stresses and strains are at a point and therefore we want to get the property at that point which is eijkl at that point that's what we were going to but in order to do that we have to start with something which is an infinitesimal sized volume element and then we want to uh, go about doing that so now if it's tau to one on this when i move to the top the only change that i am making is the x2 coordinate so in other words i'm moving by a distance delta x2 right from this surface to this surface so therefore you will have that same tau to one on this along with a change that change delta to tau to t1 whatever that will be will be in turn equal to the partial derivative of tau to 1 with respect to x2 because that's what you're changing and the actual change in x2 that has happened which is your delta x2 right so that's what you have there similarly if you go from this to this only thing you are changing is a changing x1 by an amount delta x1 right so you will have the stress tau 1 2 as it is that is the major part then you will have a small change delta tau 1 2 and that change will be given by how tau 1 2 itself changes with respect to x1 because that's what is changing from this uh, phase to this phase multiply by how much x1 changes it changes by an amount delta x1 so you multiply that by delta x1 right so now we see that we have the values for the stresses and all the four surfaces there now i'm in a position to take the moment about any point now which point do you think uh, if I take the moment about will result in the simplest equations because I, I can call this names A this corner A B C and D okay. truly speaking they are edges because it is a cuboidal volume that I am having delta x1 delta x2 is what I have shown but into or out of the board I have delta x3 as well right so now it is on those surfaces about which corner edge that we are talking of which edge if I take edge A, edge B, edge C or edge D I have to take the moment in order to get the simplest set of equations yeah why because you will get rid of the delta tau exactly exactly so the more complex expressions for tau are on these two phases and if I choose a point through which those stresses are passing then it will not have a moment because the moment arm will be zero and therefore uh, I need to deal with only the other two stresses okay so now I need to deal with only these two stresses if I want to take the moment uh, and the moment that I am setting remember uh, in a 3d problem like this there are three components or three measure numbers to the moment which is m1 m2 m3 the what which m are we talking about here which moment are we interested in here m1 m1 will be about the x1 direction m3 right because it is essentially this moment that we are talking about and that is parallel to the x3 coordinates is coordinate or uh, axis or uh, the b3 uh, unit vector right so therefore that is an m3 okay so m3 we typically write like this so your m3 and that m3 moment is about c about the point c it should be zero about any point but we can take it about c right which is the simplest to, to see now what is the moment moment is force into moment arm right but the force itself is the stress times the area on which it is acting right so first we have to get the forces so forces and then we'll multiply by the moment arm so for this stress the moment arm is delta x1 about the point c right so that's 
going to multiply by delta x1 but what is the force itself the force is caused by the stress here tau 1 2 and what is the area on which it acts delta x2 but that's just a length measure right remember that you have in the x3 direction also you have the uh, body it's a cuboidal element okay so it's, it's a delta x3 which is perpendicular to the board right so that you have you have delta x3 so in other words you have all these quantities 1 2 and 3 right so that's what you have from that now you have to see the sign whether it is positive or negative okay and if it's along the positive b3 or the positive x3 coordinate then it is to get to that you have b1 along this b2 along this b1 cross b2 should give you a b3 which is coming out of the board right so that's the positive direction of the uh, b3 axis uh, x3 axis as well as your moment m3 right so if that is the positive moment what about this tau 1 2 is it causing a positive or a negative moment about c positive right so i leave it as it is right now coming to this guy over here is it positive or negative it's going into the board right so it's negative once again i have to put the force in the bracket and the moment arm what is the moment arm for tau 2 1 about c yeah so that's the distance from the line of action to that perpendicular distance so that's your delta x 2 right Yeah. what about the stress itself it's tau 2 1 what is the area on which it acts Correct. okay so this is good enough if you didn't uh, have any body moments like what we are assuming but in general there can be a body moment right so body moment just like you said body force it's distributed within this okay so i can call it by uh, some uh, the positive direction is this so let's say small m3 okay which is the moment per unit volume okay so the si unit for uh, moments is newton meter right because force is in newtons and the newton multiplied by distance is the uh, moment but this is per unit volume which means because it's a distributed moment just like distributed forces are newton per meter if it's distributed along a length newton per meter squared if it's distributed along the area newton per meter cube if it's distributed along a body just like your body weight is distributed in newton per meter cube right so similarly you have a moment distributed over a volume so that's essentially you're talking about that m3 now that m3 will also contribute to your moment equilibrium as a whole right oh did i put it wrong sorry because out of the board right so it's coming out of the board so that's the positive direction of m3 right so now uh, you see i have already accounted for the effect of tau 1 2 and tau 2 1 but i have not yet accounted for your m3 right so m3 also has to be added to this and the way i have shown m3 now is positive uh, direction so i have to add m3 to this right now it's very clear now i have the resultant moment due to all the forces or stresses that are acting including the distributed uh, body moments that are there now what happens is that i have to for equilibrium i have to set this equal to zero right so if i set this m3c equal to 0 the resultant moment about c okay so parallel to the x3 direction of course uh, because you have m1 m2 also in general right so now when you see these two now if you invoke that particular assumption that there is no body moment then your m3 will equal to be equal to 0 but if you don't then you will see that what you actually have over here is that sorry this should be a moment so this should be this is remember the moment per unit volume okay so what is the total volume of this we have to take that into account yeah total volume of this 
element is delta x1, delta x2, delta x3, right? So I have to multiply by that. So what was Newton meter per meter cube multiplied by meter cube becomes Newton meter. Okay. So all three terms on the right hand side have the unit of moment which is Newton meter. Right. So now you have this and now if you see in these expressions there are all three x1, x2, x3. Similarly x1, x2, x3 here as well and this is what you have uh, on this as well. So now if you set this equal to 0 uh, then you see that you can divide the whole thing by delta x1, delta x2 delta x3 and you end up with tau 1 2 minus tau 2 1 plus m3 equal to 0 right so this is the difference between two of the shear stresses on the same set of coordinates right so 1 2 and 2 1 you're just only interchanging them but the m3 plays a role in how whether they are equal or not so once we introduce that because it's our material is no longer uh, <coughs> having any uh, thing like a dipole distribution etc in fact doesn't have any um, body moment distribution therefore that is equal to 0 then only you can say tau 1 2 equal to tau 2 1 okay so this is a very very important thing to remember because a lot of people are using uh, many different multifunctional materials and continue to use this simplified equation which is not valid for that case you have to bring in the actual uh, body moment distributions depending on whichever uh, field that uh, you're operating that material in uh, you have to do that and uh, even for the simplest case of magnetic materials you know that you're operating in the earth's uh, magnetic field then you have to appropriately account for that and therefore the differences between these two okay so now Keeping that aside, coming back to what we started off saying is that yes, now i and j can be interchanged. Just because i and j were not equal to each other, we represented sigma by tau, but it's the same quantity that we are calling as sigma over here, all the off diagonal terms of the stress uh, matrix in a particular set of equation, a set, set of axes that we have, uh, two sets of axes that we have introduced. So now that sig i and j can be interchanged means that instead of nine terms on the left hand side you now have only six independent ones you still have nine non-zero in general but only six of them are independent so six independent on the left six independent on the right so therefore this is also uh, six into six thirty six so it's come down from eighty one to fifty four to thirty six now okay so we have a fairly uh, simple uh, set now i just wanted to complete this before we break for lunch uh, so uh, with the third assumption we have come to a stage uh, where it is the simplest form that we have over here but now these two interchanges that we are talking about i and j being interchanged or k and l being interchanged remember are both in subscripts or both in superscripts okay it is not across the superscript and subscript I have not yet said if I can interchange i j with k l okay now this kind of interchange is called as a minor symmetry this is also a minor symmetry in the afternoon session we will see whether ij and kl can be interchanged with each other which is called as a major symmetry obviously the other opposite of what we are talking about right how uh, ij and kl uh, could within themselves be interchanged because either the stress could be interchanged uh, which means the stress is symmetric or the strains could be interchanged half diagonally which means that the strain is symmetric now there has to be something beyond individually stress or strain alone to what is the interaction taking place between the stress and the strain which is when i can uh, end up with a major symmetry which is what we will look in the look at to start with in the afternoon class thank you any questions on this before we break it's good right good to go yeah we'll meet in the afternoon maybe 250